It is now time for oral questions. The member for Nipissing. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Premier. Uh, there is a disturbing scenario playing out right now, uh, Speaker. Last October 6th, your government failed to deliver the long-range assessment of Ontario's finances as obligated under the Fiscal Transparency and Accountability Act. We were told they would be in the fall economic statement, but they weren't. In fact, there were no individual ministry expense numbers listed, just the total program spending, which magically falls in 2017 to balance the budget. And on February 15th, the Transparency Act also requires you to publish third quarter results. Again, nothing. Premier, you continue to keep any real numbers Question. from this legislature. Is it because any one of those numbers would demonstrate you're not on track to balance the budget? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I, you know, I, uh, I invite the member opposite, unlike last year, when this year's budget comes out, that he actually read the document because he obviously yes. has a number of questions. I'm not sure whether he uh, actually read the fall economic statement, but again, I would ask that he read the fall economic statement because, as I said, there is information in that document that makes it clear what our intentions are, what the numbers are, and I hope that he will take the opportunity to do that. But, Mr. Speaker, I will say this, that we will be bringing the budget forward, Mr. Speaker. We will be uh, making it clear that we are on track to uh, eliminate the deficit by 2017-18, but we will also make it clear, Mr. Speaker, that we are intent in making the investments yes, in people and in infrastructure and in a strong business climate to make sure that we have a prospering and growing economy, Mr. Speaker, investments that the member opposite Members would not Prince be willing to, to, to make. Thank you, uh, Speaker. Premier, it's too bad that, uh, uh, that uh, you didn't tell the bond rating agencies last May that you had a $4.5 billion gap in your budget. That's above and beyond your planned deficit of 11.7 this year, above your planned deficit of $10.4 billion next year, and above the $7.2 billion deficit the year after. Your annual deficits are larger than every other province, plus the national deficit combined. It's clear you can't manage our money, so while other provinces are putting people back to work, your cabinet was told, quote, there are fewer jobs relative to our population and more unemployed and quote per capita output of the economy remains below its pre-recession benchmark premier you're Question. failing ontarians you can't make the tough decisions and the ones you do make turn into scandals if you won't bring a plan Thank to you. turn ontario around will you at least <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The plan that the member opposite and his leader are putting forward is to cut and slash across government, Mr. Speaker. It's to fire education workers, fire health care workers, Mr. Speaker, drive good jobs out of the province. The member from Northumberland come to order. Speaker. So, if the member opposite is asking, will we take that path? We absolutely will not, Mr. Speaker. That is not in the best interest of the people of this province. It is not in the best interest of the economy of this province. So we will bring our budget forward. We will make the investments that are necessary. We will partner with business, Mr. Speaker. We will work with key industries to make sure that they can expand, like the announcement I made yesterday at Fiera Foods, Mr. Speaker, where there will be more jobs created because of our partnering with that business. Yep. We will continue to do that work, Mr. Speaker. It would be Answer. it would be wonderful if the member opposite joined with us because it is in the best interest of the people of this province that we make those investments Thank and you. put that support in place. Two final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Premier, it seems there's no limit to your planned revenue tools. You're going to tax hardworking families, you're going to tax business, maybe a tobacco tax, a transit increase. Your own finance ministry proposes another way to kill jobs while restocking your coffers. Here's what they had to say about your, quote, partnering with business. This is a quote. Development charges are a great idea. The developers of condos make a killing, presumably given how many condos there are always being built. This is how you view the business community. Just another pocket to pick. They make a killing. Let's go after them. Never mind, they actually put people to work. Why not kill that industry too, just as long as you get a few bucks from them before they leave. Is that how you plan to budget, Premier? 
kill the golden goose? Thank you. Mr. Finance. You see it, please? Thank you. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, the member opposite has engaged in rhetoric and trash talk about the good work that Ontarians have been doing over the last number of years since the recession. He hasn't read the reports over the last year, for that matter, Mr. Speaker. And don't take it from us. C.D. Howe Institute, someone that they always respect, has come out and said very clearly. Ontario leads all provinces right throughout Canada on transparency and on integrity of our numbers, rated an A because of the work that we've done. They, however, did not, and will continue to do what's right for Ontarians. We'll continue to put on a very wholesome and strong plan to create jobs, and they have created jobs. You guys keep wanting to destroy the well-being of our economy by the reckless cuts that you're making. And, Mr. Speaker, on this side of the House, we're making investments, and we're being positive to all of Ontario and for Canada. Your question, the, later, the, the member from Nepean and Carleton. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question, as well, is to the Premier. Over the weekend, you touted a line uh, called "What Leadership Is." Now, I can tell you what it isn't. It's two OPP investigations into your government. It's losing 330,000 manufacturing jobs. It is using a billion dollar of taxpayer money to save five Liberal seats. It's breaking international law, and it's withholding uh, information from the electorate on the 4.5 billion dollar hole in their budget. So. So they've demonstrated what leadership is not. I can tell you what leadership is. It is testing your policies and your record with the electorate. Order. So we ask on this side of the House, will you do that? Will you finally table a budget and will you put it to a vote, not only in this assembly, but also with the electorate? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I, uh, I thank the uh, member opposite for the question. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of the things that have happened over the, the previous few years. We've got, when we came into office, 68% of students in this uh, province were graduating from high school. Now, 83% of are graduating from high school, Mr. Speaker. When we came into office, the energy system was in disarray, Mr. Speaker. We have invested in transmission. We have a stable energy grid, Mr. Speaker. We have generation of clean Member from renewable Prince energy. Province, when we came into office, there was no Member measurement of wait time for the health care system, Mr. Speaker. We led the way in measuring wait times, and those wait times that we have measured have come down, Mr. Speaker. From my perspective, Answer. those are all impacts on the lives of people in this province that will have a huge difference, and that's what leadership is, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. This is a premier who's led the way on a few things, innovation, for example, in scandals. And the premier knows full well that this recent scandal with her budget is actually the gas plants 2.0. I'm going to run down the formula. It's actually something we can now count on with this government. First, it's a desperation by a government that is about to lose everything. Second, you're going to find documents from bureaucrats cautioning them against the Liberals' preferred course of action. Third, is that they develop spin lines and media diversions to manipulate the media. And the Minister press, of Energy, like come to order. Press, like accountability bills to throw us all off. Fourth, we go back to those documents put forward by the bureaucrats and we find that they either redact them or they destroy them. And five, when all else fails, they try to shut down debate by either prorogation or trying to censor a member who has, who has exposed them for what they are. So that's not leadership. The government has an opportunity. The Premier has an opportunity. Show some leadership. Demonstrate with the budget. Table it here. Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, we actually will table the budget here. We will not go to Magna or anywhere else, Mr. Speaker. We will table the budget here. And, uh, and I, look forward, I look forward to the member opposite reading that budget. And let me just, let me just outline, Mr. Speaker, the kinds of things that we are going to be focusing on in order to grow the economy, because I really think that is critical at this juncture, Mr. Speaker. We are going to invest in infrastructure. And unlike the party opposite, we believe that having a plan to invest in roads and bridges and in transit, Mr. Speaker, that that's very important to growth of the economy. We're going to be investing in skills and training, because we know that businesses come here and businesses tell us 
over and over again that the educated workforce the member is from a Northumberland huge to order. benefit to business in this province, and it draws them here. We're going to continue Answer. to invest in a youth strategy. 30,000 young people getting placements already. More than 9,000 young people have an opportunity. Thank you. That's the kind of work we're going to be doing. Mr. Thank Speaker. you. Final supplementary. Well, sadly, 330,000 manufacturing jobs have left the province under your watch. We have the highest industrial uh, hydro rates in North America. People are leaving to Quebec, to Manitoba, to New York to, to actually set up shop rather than stay here in the great province of Ontario. In fact, if you look at the confidence of that plan, she has lost seven MPPs as of today from her government. Speaker, I believe for a new premier, that is actually unprecedented. So I just asked the premier. She will have a day of reckoning whether she wants it or not. At some point in time, there will be uh, an ability for the opposition and the public to look at her books, either when she's out of power or before then. And on that day, they will know, the Ontarians will know, the true cost of her premiership. And we will know why so many MPPs in her own party do not have confidence in her and have decided either to leave now or leave later. She's desperately clinging to power. She has a choice. Table the budget now. Let Ontarians know what's in it and where that $4.5 billion is. Thank you. Can you say it, please? Thank you, Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I just want to say I have the best team in the yeah. province, Mr. Speaker. And I am so proud of the people that I work with. And I am so proud of the people who have done their service that are moving on other things. The best team. So, Mr. Speaker, we're we as the member opposite knows, we passed the legislation that would open the books before an election, Mr. Speaker. We we're the that brought that in, Mr. Speaker. We brought that legislation in because of what had happened under the previous government where there had been a $5.6 billion deficit hidden. We brought in legislation that requires government to open the books. We will do that, and we have been doing that, Mr. Speaker. And I just want to say, I just want to say that the investments that we are going to make, the balance that we are going to strike between Answer. fiscal responsibility and investment is critical. Roger Martin said closing the prosperity gap cannot be done without making mean of meaningful and targeted investments in productivity, Thank enhancing you. resources and tools. We are going to take that advice, Thank Mr. You. Speaker. Thank you. New question, the Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. After spending months claiming that she's offering real change this weekend, the Premier declared that her new goal is defending the status quo of Dalton McGuinty. For families worried about job loss, that's very concerning. They know that more of the same strategy of sky-high hydro rates and no attached corporate tax loopholes is going to leave them looking for work. Just weeks ago, the Premier said people were looking for change. Why is it she is now so determined to offer more of the same? Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I think, I think what I said on the weekend was that this is a very important time in the history of the economy in Ontario and that what we need, Mr. Speaker, is we need to make sure that we make the right decisions. And from my perspective, Mr. Speaker, that means playing to our strengths. It means making the investments where they are most necessary and strategically, Mr. Speaker. So that's investing in the talent and skills of our people. It means investing in infrastructure. And I would say to the leader of the third party, that includes transit, Mr. Speaker. It includes making investments in transit and in roads and and bridges, infrastructure across the province. It means, Mr. Speaker, uh, working with business. It doesn't mean making business the enemy, whether that's small business or large, large corporations. It means working with them so that Answer. they can expand and they can create jobs, Mr. Speaker. That's what I talked about this weekend, and that's the work that we have been doing and will continue Thank doing. You. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, the Premier spent the weekend talking about Liberal hands, but for families across Ontario, the only thing steady about the McGuinty legacy is the steady flow of money out of their pockets and the steady flow of jobs out of Ontario. Those hands brought us the gas plant scandal and billions of dollars in waste. Those hands left Ontario with some of the highest hydro rates, the highest auto insurance rates, and an unemployment rate stuck above the national average for years. Does the Premier really think offering more of the same is good enough, Speaker? Thank you, Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, 
I would suggest that what our hands have wrought is not the status quo, Mr. Speaker. We're on track to meet our goal of an average 8 percent reduction in auto insurance by August 2014. We've increased funding to home care and community services by $260 million in 2013. That's a 6 percent increase over last year, Mr. Speaker, and it's $185 million to provide it for CCACs to provide home care services alone. So that's a huge investment in the transformation of the health care system, Mr. Speaker. We've created a $100 million small rural and northern municipal infrastructure fund. That means that those investments in roads and bridges in our northern and rural Order. communities can go ahead, Mr. Speaker. And we know that those small economies, those local economies, are dependent on that kind of infrastructure investment. Recently, more than uh, four more companies Answer. in southwestern Ontario will receive supports through the Southwestern Ontario Development Fund. That's not the status quo, Mr. Speaker. That's an in that's investment in economic growth. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, the Premier won her Liberal leadership talking about change and possibility, but it's more and more clear she's offering the same Dalton McGuinty status quo that brought us sky high hydro rates, a gas plant scandal, and left Ontarians down over 300,000 manufacturing jobs. People want to see action to lower their hydro bills and make life more affordable. People want to see action that creates jobs. Why is the Premier insisting that the same old ideas are somehow working? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, let me just continue on the things that uh, that we have done that are actually new. And uh, I know that the leader of the third party will know that there was uh, there was a big discussion about the minimum wage, which she did not take part yeah, in, Mr. Right. Speaker. But we are raising the minimum wage as of June 11th, and then we're going to bring let, then we're bringing legislation. We brought legislation that I hope she will support to index the minimum wage to CPI. We've introduced legislation to strengthen the strengthen the Employment Standards Act, and that'll provide more protection for vulnerable workers. I would hope that the leader opposite would support that new initiative. We passed the Local Food Act, and as part of that, Mr. Speaker, there's a $30 million local food fund, which is helping to make investments in the agri-food industry to help that industry grow. I hope that the uh, leader of the third party understands that that's a very important thing. We've passed Stronger Protection for Ontario Consumers Act, and those those, those initiatives protect consumers, and I hope that the leader of the third party understands how important that is. We passed the Supporting Small Businesses Act and increases the exemption from the employer health tax Thank you. Uh, exemption. So that, Mr. Speaker, is change. Thank you. Yeah. Your question, the leader of the third party. My next question is also for the Premier. If we want to see where Liberal hands have steered us into the ditch, we don't have to look much farther than our hydro system. The Premier insists that the system is working, but people like Grant from Renfrew, for, Renfrew, for example, disagree. He wrote, quote, I'm on a fixed income with an older home, and hydro bills are affecting my life. Unquote. His ups, he's upset that his family is paying costs that he calls way too high so that others can, quote, make money exporting what we pay for with no return for us, unquote. Why is the Premier so determined to defend a hydro system that leaves people like Grant paying more and more and lagging behind? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know that the Minister of Energy will want to uh, speak to this uh, in the supplementary. But uh, you know, I, I also know that the people of this province want an electricity system that they can rely on, Mr. Speaker. I understand that there are challenges, and the Minister will speak to some of the initiatives that we've taken to make sure that we reduce those costs for people, particularly who are having uh, trouble making ends, be ends meet, Mr. Speaker. But when we came into office, the the electricity system was in disarray, Mr. Speaker. It was absolutely critical that the neglect that had been in place for years was tended to, Mr. Speaker. We have done that. We have made those investments, Mr. Speaker. And on top of that, we have moved to a much cleaner and more renewable energy supply, Mr. Speaker. We're very proud of that, and we are going to continue to do that work. And at the same time, recognizing that there need to be programs in place Answer. to help people to deal with their energy costs. And I. Uh, I know that the uh, leader of the third party makes sure that her constituents know about Thank all those you. programs, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. 
Speaker John from Sudbury is working hard to minimize his bills, but he's clear when he says, and I quote, we should not be exporting power if we cannot afford to keep rates reasonably low at home. We should know by now that privatization does not save citizens money. High management costs usually ends up costing us more, unquote. In Manitoba and Quebec, businesses pay literally half of what we're charging Ontario businesses, and they're selling their exports for nearly twice as much. Is the Premier ready to take the waste out of the hydro system and take action to lower rates in Ontario instead of lowering them in the U.S.? Thank you, Premier. Mr. Of Energy. Of Energy. Mr. Speaker, uh, let's talk about Charlie from Hamilton. Well, let's talk about let's talk about Anne from Toronto, who are having multiple, multiple smog days, Mr. Speaker, every single summer. Mr. Speaker, we had a dirty system. A dirty system, and we had a deficit of supply. We invested in new generation, Mr. Speaker. We took the opportunity to clean our air. That party, Mr. Speaker, doesn't care that we had to spend additional dollars for clean energy as opposed to dirty coal. Cheap, dirty coal is what you sound like right now. We cleaned our air, and our, we have healthier people in our community right now. And I hope I have the opportunity in the next question to talk about electricity prices, because your plan is a scam. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, it's sad to see a Minister of Energy joke about the real struggles of the people in this province. Hydro bills aren't just numbers he might need to know. People are wondering how they're going to be able to keep up. Helena from Hamilton wrote us to say, quote, we are a senior couple with limited income and no way to increase our income. The hydro bill Order. keeps increasing, and while we are still able to pay it, my concern is what happens when one of us dies and all these expenses of the house will have to come into one, uh, out of one income. Raising the cost of hydro affects all of us in the country, and we need sensible heads to see how things like funding the export of hydro is affecting those who can least afford it." Unquote. Now, is the Premier ready to admit that her hydro plan isn't working and it's time to take Question. the waste out of the hydro system so people like Helena aren't worried about her future and the future of her family. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, you know, we're, we're talking about an election these days and uh, the opposition is asking for an election. There will be a day of reckoning when that party is going to have to stand before the people of Ontario and tell them what they will do. Mr. Speaker, they don't want new. Uh, stop the clock, please. I um, no, I would, and I did. And I'm going to ask members to again not refer to anyone other than their title or their writing, and that's the kind of heckling that causes the escalation of the emotions. And I want it to diminish. No, it's not funny. It's serious. Well, that's too bad. Please finish. Mr. Speaker, uh, they talk about creating an energy system that will be beneficial to people in Ontario. Yet, Mr. Speaker, they will not build new nuclear. They will not refurbishing the exist. They will not refurbish the existing units, Mr. Speaker. There's 50 percent of our electricity generation that they would cut off at the knees, Mr. Speaker. So, what are they going to replace it with, Mr. Speaker? How long will it take? What yes, will sir. the cost be? And what will that do to increasing prices? Mr. Speaker, we have comparative prices on electricity price costs. Ottawa, 12.39 cents uh, per kilowatt hour, Mr. Speaker. Edmonton, 13.9. Thank you. New question. The member from New Market Aurora. My uh, question is to the Premier. Speaker, at the root of the orange scandal, according to the Auditor General's uh, 2012 report, were the following findings. First and foremost, the Ministry of Health failed in its oversight responsibilities. It failed to get proper information relating to patient pickup and response. There was a lack of transparency surrounding the financial affairs of that organization. There were questionable procurement practices that are now under criminal investigation. Speaker, that was in 2012. We now have a recent audit report issued by the Ministry of Finance that made 48 findings of Orange 
that included the very same issues that the Auditor General identified in 2012. Question. My question to the Premier is, is she aware of that report, and how is it that under new management, a new board, a new CEO, under a new amended Thank performance you. agreement, we have the Thank same you. issues at all? Thank you. Premier, to long-term care. Speaker, and uh, I'm very pleased to say that Orange has already implemented 39 of the 48 recommendations outlined in the report and that progress is being made on the remaining nine, Speaker. And we will continue to work with Orange as they implement the, uh, the uh, remaining recommendations. I can tell you that this work builds on other accountability measure measures that have been undertaken Member by from Durham, come to order. new leadership. Uh, they've released their strategic plan. They've submitted their first quality improvement plan. They're posting salaries of senior leadership online. They're activating the new whistleblower hotline, establishing a conflict That's of great. interest protocol. Yeah. Uh, they've got their first patient advocate in place. Uh, they've got a, a travel and business expense Answer. policy that requires submitted expenses to be a, a, appropriate speaker. Orange is on the right track, and Thank I look you. forward to the member opposite supporting Bill 11. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, you see, we don't believe any of that because under that new board, under the new CEO, under the minister's new oversight branch, under the minister's new amended performance agreement, this audit report was conducted over an entire year under that new management, under that new board, and the same issues appear. Here they are a lack of documentation of board decisions, a lack of board approval of significant policies, including procurement, travel and expenses, the compensation system, the performance pay. Speaker, under the new board, contracts valued at between $100,000 and $750,000 were not signed in accordance with Orange's signing authority. Reaction, response times are not being properly reported. I'd like to know from the Premier, Question. because the list goes on. The incompetency continues. I'd like to know how come the same minister continues to have the responsibility to oversee Orange and our air ambulance. Thank you. Minister of Health. Well, Speaker, I think uh, any um, any uh, independent observer would recognize that order. is well into a new the, uh, chapter. The uh, member from Prince Edward leadership Hastings leadership will come of, uh, to order, Dr. and the, the member from Durham and will come Ian to order. Delaney. Uh, they have put together a very strong team. Yeah. The board is an entirely Excellent voluntary question. board, Speaker, and they have been dedicated to implementing all of the recommendations. So let me repeat: Orange has already—I've read it. Orange has already implemented 39 of the 48 recommendations, Speaker. The remaining nine are underway. What I can tell you, Speaker, is that there's also been an, an increased focus on patient safety. They've provided additional training for helicopter pilots, Answer. including controlled flight into terrain. They've revised operating procedures for night operations. They're installing solar lighting plants. There's a lot happening, Thank you. and it's all good. Please pass Bill 11. Thank you. Question the member from Hamilton East, Stony Creek. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, for months this government has carried on about government transparency and accountability, but what Ontarians are getting is more of the same stonewalling. Yep. Now we hear about more firings at the Pan Parapan Games and, and more fat cat severances. Yep. First it was Ian Troop being replaced by Saad Rafi. Now as more executives are being shown the door, new Liberal insiders are walking through that door. Speaker, will the Premier tell Ontarians how much they paid Neela Barton in severance when she left the former Premier's office? How much we're paying her now? Is severance included in her new contract and why? And how much are we paying in severance to those most recently fired executives? Wow. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know that the Minister of uh, Tourism, Culture and Sport will want to uh, speak to the details, but I just want the, uh, I want the member opposite to know that uh, 
TO 2015, uh, the Pan Am uh, group is working in coordination with the provincial government and the federal government and 15 municipalities, Mr. Speaker, to deliver the Pan Am Games. And part of their mandate, part of T, uh, TO 2015's mandate, is to ensure the efficient and effective delivery of the games. And that means uh, dealing with human resources issues, Mr. Speaker. So I have complete confidence in uh, both the chair and uh, the CEO, Mr. Speaker. I know that they are making decisions. We have no control over uh, the uh, the HR decisions, Mr. Speaker, uh, in terms of who they may or may not hire, and they will make those decisions. Those decisions are made by the CEO of uh, TO 2015, yes, and the organize the organizing committee is shifting from the planning stage into the operational stage, Mr. Speaker, into the lead-up of the game. So it makes sense that there would be HR changes. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. I think the Premier answered my question right off the bat. No control. Speaker, there's a pattern emerging here in the Pan Parapan Games, a pattern that keeps costs going up, whether it's security costs that uh, are ballooning, golden parachutes for well-connected executives, soft landings for Dalton McGuinty insiders like Neela Barton. It's an arrogant way, Speaker, to treat Ontario's money, and it's time to show that hardworking, tax-paying families get some respect in this province. Speaker, will the Premier release these contracts and these severance agreements today? Thank you, Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, you know, I agree with the member opposite that there's a pattern emerging, and the pattern is that members of the opposition and the third party, even though they have the information, they can take part in technical briefings, Order. Mr. Speaker, they're getting, they're getting the information, they know that the work is proceeding, Mr. Speaker, and that there is going to be a terrific legacy, they continue to talk down the pan para pan games, Mr. Speaker. It makes no sense to me. It makes absolutely no sense to me. And I just heard a member of the opposition say a waste of money. And I would ask him to talk to the young athletes in his riding, Mr. Speaker. I would ask him to talk to the kids who are swimming and running and training, Mr. Speaker, and getting ready for the pan para pan. I'd ask him to talk to those kids. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Question the member from the Tonto North. Merci, Monsieur le Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Labour, Yasser Nabi. Determines its prosperity. Our own. The member from Durham is warned. Finish, please. Our own investments, Speaker, include full-day kindergarten leading up to world-class schooling, and this, of course, is especially valued by people in my own riding of Etobicoke North. And for many young Ontarians, this is followed by remarkable opportunities at the college and university level. Speaker, as you may know, our Youth Employment Fund has helped over 8,200 young people find meaningful employment, which, of course, is commendable. It, I still hear how difficult it is for folks to enter the workforce and how internships are often the only way to get in the door. Youth in Etobicoke, Speaker, are concerned about internships where they're not paid, and I'm concerned about this as well. So my question is this, Speaker. What is the ministry doing to make sure that when young people in my community question. start a new job, they'll be paid for that work? Thank you. Minister of Labour. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. I want to thank the, the member from Etobicoke North for asking a very timely question. Speaker, we know that building a stronger workforce is about building a safe and fair workplaces. In Ontario, Speaker, the rules about internships are very clear. It does not matter what your job title or position is. If you perform for work for someone, you are covered by the Employment Standards Act, Speaker, and deserve to pay at least the minimum wage. There is a narrow exemption for co-op students from accredited university and college programs, trainees, and self-employed individuals. Speaker, the ministry has been very active on this issue to get the word out. We updated our web page on internships to provide clarity on this particular issue. We also have been proactively writing letters and reached out to post-secondary institutions, employers, job sites, to make sure there's no confusion mm -hmm. around what the rules Answer. are in the legislation. Speaker, we are also active on Facebook, on, on Twitter, on YouTube, making sure that we can broadcast our strong uh, rules to young people in Ontario. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. Supplementary. Thank you, Minister, or in Urdu, shukriya. I appreciate your outlining the strong rules that we have on internships in, in Ontario. My constituents in Etobicoke North in particular value the fact that the ministry is reaching out to young people, businesses, and institutions to raise awareness of these rules. 
But, Speaker, I sometimes hear from Etobicoke North residents that even though they know the Ministry of Labour is out there to help them, they are reluctant sometimes to reach out. This was also raised in a press conference by the member from Davenport when he announced his private member's bill on internships. So, Speaker, my question is this. Are formal complaints and reactive inspections the only way the ministry will investigate? Thank you, Minister. Speaker, thank you very much. I think this is a very, very important and serious question, and, and, and I, I, I welcome the participation of all members in getting the message across. Speaker, I can assure the member opposite that uh, our member, that our government is doing our very best to ensure that our youth's uh, rights are protected. Any concerns regarding working arrangements can be referred to the Ministry of Labor's hotline at 1-800-531-5551. Uh, speaker, confidential help is available in 23 different languages, and this includes anonymous tips as well. The ministry will investigate any and all complaints to enforce our rules. We are, Speaker, the first government to conduct proactive inspections. And while out in the field, our enforcement officers are specifically also asking Answer. about internships. Speaker, I also announced last December they will be doing a proactive employment enforcement blitz dealing with internships, specifically uh, starting in June. Thank, thank you very you. much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Question. The member from Kitchener, Conestoga. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is for the minister. Minister of Transportation. Minister, the amount of money the Liberal government wasted on cancelling two gas plants in Mississauga and Oakville a couple billion could have paid dollars. for Highway 7 expansion in my community nearly four times over. Yet you pulled the plug on both plants with no forethought nope. on the cost or the consequences. Now, the number of infrastructure projects in the region of Waterloo and Guelph area are starting to pile up. And specifically, both Highway 85 and Highway 6 require infrastructure upgrades. So, Minister, after wasting billions of dollars on the gas plant scandals and debt interest payments, what plans do you have to upgrade these roads and how much money will you invest? Thank you, Minister of Infrastructure and Transportation. Uh, I, I want to thank the member for the friendly question. Um, <laughs> The irony is, Mr. Speaker, is we're spending $14 billion a year on infrastructure, or 2 per cent of our GDP. His federal party is spending $73 million, or less than a fraction of 1 per cent of, of GDP, one of the worst records ever. The gas plants, I guess they buy them at garage sales, Mr. Speaker, because they must get some discount, because they were the ones who promised first to cancel them. And those gas plants have been relocated, not cancelled, and actually are producing energy, Mr. Speaker, because the people in Oakville and Mississauga asked for that, Mr. Speaker. So that money is out there working. I know. I know we had to fulfill his promise for them, Answer. but I guess you know maybe we should. Uh, maybe there's some gas uh, plant uh, uh, discount sales at garage uh, at garage sales in Conestoga Thank that you. I'm not aware about, uh, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Yeah. Uh, what was that all about? Again, to the minister, I'll, I'll ask him a second time. So last weekend, your premier said, or our premier said, that she will not negotiate with the NDP on the budget. Then today, we learned that the Liberal government will pack its budget full of reckless policies that will appease the anti-business oh, stance of the guys. NDP. So I guess the Premier is right in fact. There is no room for negotiation when the plan is to give everything, everything. to the NDP. <laughs> it's sad that Ontario has a government that spends the majority of its time developing new ways to placate the NDP, while ignoring critical infrastructure needs Order. in municipalities like the region of Waterloo and the Guelph area. Minister, forget about the garage sales. Will you just admit that you will do anything to cling to power, General, even if that means order. ignoring infrastructure Question. investment and plunging the province into more debt just to appease Shame. the NDP? Without comment, Minister. Thanks. You know, I, I, I have to encourage my friend opposite Mr. Speaker to read budgets. Uh, you know, you know, read. You know, as 
readers are leaders, Mr. Speaker, and they would you'd save a lot of time in here because he would know that there's already $50 million in the budget uh, for Highway 7 between Kitchener and Guelph, and that we have made numerous commitments to complete that. And we're quite excited about that. And why can't we do that, Mr. Speaker? Because the last year that they were in power, power in this province, they spent $1.4 billion totally on schools and water. What does $1.4 billion buy you, Mr. Speaker? It certainly doesn't buy you Highway 7 or Highway 85. So we are now spending 10 times what you spent on infrastructure so that we can build Highway 7. Maybe he could talk to his federal friends because we just added four go, go trains to Kitchener Waterloo, yes, and your federal cousins cancelled four VIA trains. So 10% spending of what we do thank to you. cancel rapid transit projects we add them thank you it's the garage sale part thank you new question the member from nickel belt thank you mr speaker i have a question for the health minister speaker this morning the ontario health coalition released their report entitled for health or for wealth the report details dozens and dozens of examples of extra billing user fees and sale of queue jumping for services, all of those in clear violation of the provincial and federal laws. OHC researchers found that the clinics were charging patients between $50 and $3,500 for OHIP insured medical services. Is the minister concerned about those violations and is she prepared to do anything about them? Well, Speaker, I will be absolutely clear on this. The commitment to the Future of Medicare Act, which we passed in 2004, very clearly states that there may be no charges for insured services. Speaker, uh, we uh, uh, we hold true to that value, Speaker. And if there are examples of clinics charging patients, then that needs to be reported, and we act on that, Speaker, because the protection of our single-tier system is of paramount importance to us. So, uh, Speaker, we are uh, doing many things to transform our health care system. One of them is uh, looking at establishing specialty clinics outside the walls of the hospital. And I know the member opposite is familiar with the birthing centres that we've already opened, one in Ottawa, one in Toronto, Answer. Speaker, to support people to have their babies uh, outside the walls of the hospital but in a safe environment. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, the Ontario Health Coalition did a similar report in 2008. Some of the clinics that are now charging higher fees were named in that 2008, and the minister did nothing. Speaker, the user fees, extra billing, and the upselling of medical unnecessary tests and procedure not only harms patients, they harm our health care system. When someone needs a cataract surgery or colonoscopy, they should not have to decipher the legalities of the fees, or even worse, argue about them with the physician who is going to provide that care. This government has talked a good game when it comes to protecting our public health care system, but if they fail to prevent these violations, all their talk is for nothing. My question is simple. Why is the government moving Question. more and more of these services to private clinic when it cannot assure Ontarian that public health care will be protected. Thank you. Yes, well, Speaker, I'm afraid that the member opposite uh, uh, knows, well, she knows full well that the clinics that we're talking about opening are non-profit clinics, Speaker. She knows also that we uh, enforce the con commitment to the future of Medicare, and I would urge anyone who is being charged for medically insured services report. And I'm even going to give you the phone number, 1-888-662-6613. If anyone is being charged for services that are OHIP covered, they should call that number and report it, and we will follow up. It's against the law. It is not tolerated. Thank you. New question. The member from Ottawa, Arlene. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Natural Resources. Minister, I know that MNR has a strong commitment to protecting the endangered species of our province. And that MNR has some great work to protect the habitats and help in the recovery of Ontario species at risk. I know that public stewardship efforts are integral to protecting endangered species in Ontario, 
and your ministry encourages this through programs such as the Species at Risk Stewardship Fund. I was happy to hear in the beginning of March that your ministry announced funding for a number of new projects to protect, preserve, and restore our rich biodiversity and educate others. Speaker, could the minister please tell the members of the legislature about how your ministry helps protect endangered species through public stewardship projects such as a Species at Risk Stewardship Fund? Thank you, Minister of Natural Resources. Thank you, uh, Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Ottawa, Orleans, uh, for being such a strong advocate on this issue. And our party uh, clearly stands in strong uh, contrast uh, with respect to our position on this with the opposition. The Stewardship Fund uh, enables our partners to carry out a shared vision to protect species right across the province of Ontario. Since 2007, in fact, we've uh, announced $35 million in funding for 660 projects across the province. These local stewardship grants have restored more than 24,000 hectares of habitat and have generated more than 2,100 jobs in doing so. Projects such as these, through our ministry, help to provide protection for more than 150 species at risk, Speaker, and help our ministry ensure Ontario's native species continue to contribute to our rich biodiversity. In fact, in the beginning of March, our ministry was honoured to receive a the recognition from Redford, uh, award Pembroke, from the Environmental the Commissioner of Ontario time. for our efforts to re-establish a migratory bird, the piping plover at Wasaga Beach. This recovery process was an excellent example of these stewardship programs. Yeah. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister. I'm glad that your ministry is working hard to protect threatened species such as the piping plover, and that these efforts are recognized by the Environmental Commissioner of Ontario. I have a keen interest in preserving the environment, and our province's rich biodiversity and the Species at Risk Stewardship Fund sounds like a great way for the people of Ontario to get involved and assist in that goal. Through increased knowledge and awareness, we can play a role to protect Ontario's natural spaces and the plants and animals that live in them. Could you please elaborate for the members of this House some of the projects that local groups have put into action to preserve our province's rich biodiversity? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker. And again, uh, thanks to the member for the question. Earlier in March, our ministry announced that it will be supporting 103 different projects uh, through our Species at Risk Stewardship Fund in the 2014-15 year. Uh, up to $5 million in funding will be allocated to 75 new projects and 28 ongoing multi-year projects. The number of projects taken up by local community members in our province demonstrates the dedication that Ontarians have to protecting our natural resources. One of these important projects includes an initiative by the High Park Nature Centre. They'll lead an innovative urban bat project to learn about the brown bat and northern long-eared uh, bat, which are both species at risk. Uh, speaker, as well as the Canadian Wildlife Federation will work to better understand concerns with the American eel in the Ottawa River. These are just two of the many projects that have, uh, we've uh, taken on and local community groups have supported that, that uh, demonstrates our commitment to protecting biodiversity in Ontario. Thank you. A new question. A member from Bruce Gray. Hey, hey, hey. My question is to the Minister of Health, Children and Youth Services. Children's mental health agencies are exasperated. One in five young people in Ontario need. Stop the, stop the clock, please. Stop the clock. Um, you've, you've kind of put two ministries together. I need to know which one. Seeker, children and youth. Your service, your service. Children's mental health agencies are exasperated. One in five young people in Ontario needs mental health services. Demand is going up, and so are wait times. Among the many expert groups that have expressed concern, there's a consensus that we're facing a tsunami. Although your government claims to be increasing services, Kids' mental health services in Ontario have been, in Sam. fact, grappling with unprecedented cuts to their operational funding over the years, while residential services Sam. have not seen any investment at all. Mm. As the minister responsible, what are you prepared to do to remedy the situation and help these kids in need? Here, here. Thank you. Thank you. Minister of Children and Youth Services. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the Member question with respect to children Calvin and uh, youth mental order. health. As we know, we, uh, the first three years of our, our Ontario comprehensive uh, mental health strategy was focusing on children, right. and we have made a big difference in our communities over that uh, period of time. However, I believe the uh, member opposite also recognizes that we recently released our Moving on Mental Health strategy, which directly will impact this sector and is in direct response to what we've been hearing from parents, because certainly we have been hearing from parents, from families, from youth and children. We put together the strategy. I'll let you know a little bit more about the strategy and the supplementary, Answer. but certainly our commitment remains strong to children's mental health. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Kids need action, not more strategy and study. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, I question this minister's commitment to the children and youth she's tasked with advocating for. I respectfully remind her that the agencies she's responsible for have had their budgets decrease steadily in relation to the inflation rate. Yep. Since 1992, this sector has seen a meager 8% overall increase. Sure. As such, many could close doors and send kids to the hospital emergency department as their last resort, the most costly form of care. Having wasted a billion dollars on gas plants sure. and sending millions overseas in debt interest charges, exactly. will the minister identify where she will find the money to fund community-based children's mental health programs and services? Thank you, Speaker. And again, with respect to children's mental health, we've in fact been increasing our investments in our communities. We've increased our mental health workers in schools in all our communities. We've added 770 new mental health workers in our communities. Our budget will go to 93 million dollars for children's mental health. Our moving on mental health strategy will ensure that there's a lead agency that parents don't have to tell their stories over and over again. We'll bring communities together. We'll ensure that the system is easy for parents. I have certainly been listening to parents and our youth, and we will continue to do that. We have been acting. It's not just a strategy. It's not just words. We are absolutely committed to children's mental health. The member from Beaches, East York. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. Speaker, I have been working with a group of French language parents in my riding. Uh, the Coalition de Parents pour une école secondaire de quartier is furiously working towards securing space for a French language secondary school in East Toronto. There are 1,000 French language students in desperate need of a high school that has the full facilities of a regular public or Catholic school. Currently in Toronto, Collège Français, located downtown, can only house 399 students. Monsieur le Président, est-ce que Mr. Speaker, can the minister tell us why the francophone students in eastern Toronto have to go on to downtown to be transferred to an English school for their secondary schooling? Very much, and uh, uh, I think the the uh, answer here is that when you look at the investment that we have made in uh, new French uh, language schools, that is, so people understand, we're talking here about French as a first language school boards, the French public and French Catholic school boards. That in fact we have spent about 1.3 billion dollars investing in new schools for the two. French language school boards over the past 10 years. There has been a significant investment in schools. The way the process works, Speaker, is that we ask the school boards each year to submit their capital plans and to identify their, their priorities and to present a business case for each school Response. they are requesting funding. And we look at those business cases. Uh, we've announced in this uh, recent uh, announcements we're making a number of new French uh, Catholic schools and French public. Supplementary. Speaker, there are 1,000 French language students in the east end of Toronto, and that number is set to increase by 50 per cent in the next three to four years. The minister needs to know that this is an urgent need, but it seems there is no plan in place to address it. In an effort to secure a high school in our neighbourhood, both public and Catholic school parents are working together in order to secure school space that currently exists in underutilized schools. When is the minister going to commit herself to meet the parents and work with them to find a school in East Toronto to find a school in the same area. 
can only repeat, uh, Speaker, that the process is for the relevant school boards, the, the French public and the French Catholic school boards, to identify the schools and present those in their capital plan. They are responsible for making those business cases. But just to reassure the member, in fact, we have actually announced 12 new French language schools in this year's capital plan. But they, the boards, well, the boards need to put uh, forward the business cases for because, for in fact, we have actually provided capital for uh, Viamond, for example, the uh, French public board that is responsible for Toronto. I was very delighted to Response. announce new uh, new schools for both of uh, the boards that work in the Toronto area. So I just Thank want you. to assure the member that we are Thank flowing you. money to cap Thank you. New question, the member from Oakville. Thank you, Speaker. I've got a question this morning for the Minister of Consumer Services. Minister, in my riding of Oakville, we've got many businesses, both small and large, that sell and use propane on a daily basis. I've always understood the need for the careful use of propane and the safety requirements for propane handling in business as a very volatile product that needs to be handled carefully to protect both workers and the public. It's important that there be comprehensive regulations and requirements around the storage and the handling of this product, and we need robust certification requirements for business and individuals who work with the product. So given the importance of safe propane handling, Minister, would you please share specifically how the government ensures that we have safe handling and storage of propane in Ontario? Thank you. Minister Consumer Services. How do you do that? Sir, from Oakville for raising this very serious and important topic related to <coughs> excuse me, public safety. Proper handling and storage of propane is very important to maintaining and promoting safety in Ontario. That's why we continue to implement the recommendations from the Propane Safety Review Panel 2008. We've already implemented measures such as annual inspections, propane transfer facilities, increased training requirements for employees, and risk and safety management plans as part of the licensing process. Speaker. The implementation of these recommendations has gone a long way to enhance public safety in Ontario. And as a public sector regulator, the Technical Standards Safety Answer. Authority, known as the TSSA, is charged with overseeing the requirements on and the business of handling propane. The ministry works very closely, Speaker, with the TSSA. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to uh, the minister for informing the House today about uh, the regulations and the requirements that the government already has in place to ensure the public safety in Ontario in regards to the storage and handling of propane is well handled. It's comforting to hear that we've taken action to ensure public safety when dealing with a product as volatile as propane. However, as a representative of a riding where there's a large number of small businesses and small business owners that use and sell propane, I've also heard concerns about the overregulation of businesses that need to use propane on a daily basis. So it's important to me, Speaker, that sufficient public safety is maintained, but it's got to minimize the burden on business as well. Minister, I've heard that your ministry is looking at specific measures to achieve such a result. Would you please inform the House on what those new initiatives are that you currently have under consideration? Thank you, Minister. Thank you. I'm very happy to have the opportunity to inform the House about the proposals to enhance the propane safety regime in Ontario and the ones that are currently under consideration. So the proposals aim to improve safety while minimizing the burden on business speaker by increasing efficiency and simplifying regulatory requirements. Proposals put forward for consideration range from a change in the inspection model to streamlining the approval process to, and simplifying training requirements. Some of these uh, proposals, Speaker, rise from the recommendations received from the Propane Safety Review Panel that stated that TSSA should inspect facilities annually until enough data has been gathered to develop alternative approaches to enforcement. Staff continue to accept and review public feedback on these proposals that look to relieve regulatory burden on business while, of course, maintaining and enhancing sir? public safety. Thank you. Thank you. New question. The member from Wellington, Halton Hills. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Health. 
As we know, Kalydeco is a new drug which appears to be a miracle treatment for some cystic fibrosis patients, and it gives hope to families with loved ones who are suffering from it. In recent weeks, we have listened to the government's lame excuses for the delays in the approval of funding for Kalydeco for cystic fibrosis patients like Maddie Vanstone. But it's not just Maddie Vanstone. In my riding, I've been approached by three families who've been affected by cystic fibrosis and to whom Kalydeco represents hope. Three families in my riding. Today, I'm standing up for Maddie Phipps and Shannon and Matthew Bain, all of Georgetown, and Lindsay Shaw of Fergus, all of whom have cystic fibrosis and all of whom need Kalydeco. My question to the minister is simple. Why are these families being forced to wait so long for her to announce funding for Kalydeco? <laughs> Thank you. Minister Phil Fong from Care. Well, well, thank you, Speaker. And uh, I want to be very clear that Kaleidico is a drug that offers real hope for some people with cystic fibrosis. I know that, Speaker. Uh, and I, I think it's important, though, that we do negotiate for these drugs. We have worked on a pan Canadian approach, Speaker, on this drug and 29 other drugs. And we have successfully uh, reached agreement with drug companies at prices that make it able for us to remember from more Holden, drugs come to order. for more people. For the opposition parties to, su to suggest that we simply pay whatever price the pharmaceutical company says they want to charge us is simply irresponsible. Yeah. It was not their practice when they were in office, no. and I can assure you that it's important that we negotiate the prices. And, Speaker, I hate to say this, Answer. but some pharmaceutical companies are relying on this kind of public pressure so they can charge higher drugs than they're charging in Thank other you. jurisdictions. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Mr. Speaker, the minister knows we're standing up for our constituents, so she should understand that. It's now been more than a year since I first raised this issue with the minister, and we're yeah. still waiting. I first raised the issue of Kaleidico with the minister in December 2012 in an email to her office. I spoke to her personally on February the 20th last year, and again on March 20th of last year. And I raised the need for Kaleidico funding in the legislature in debate a year ago tomorrow. I followed up in question period on May the 2nd last year, when I specifically asked the minister to commit to doing everything she could to expedite the process to approve this drug. While the government appears to be hiding behind a broken process, families worry and wait for more than a year. When will the minister announce approval for funding for Kaleidico for Ontario cystic fibrosis patients? Thank you. Speaker, I think it's important that the member opposite acknowledges that the company, the pharmaceutical company called Vertex, speaker, member from Suffering uh, Caledon come to order second time. Company, um, was funded to the tune of 75 million plus an additional 75 million promised for the development of this drug by the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation in the United States. This research and development was funded by the public speaker. I think when people donated to that cause, they expected patients would benefit. So I think the company Vertex needs to be held to account. They need to negotiate. We ought not pay higher prices for this drug than in other jurisdictions. If you really care about this, I urge you to contact the pharmaceutical Answer. company and say, take your responsibility to the people with cystic fibrosis seriously. Negotiate with us as Canadians. Canadian children. Thank you. The, uh, there are no deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.